New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Miss Perry, I want you to take a look at this picture of Barclay's body. No, please. All Nick wants to know is whether Mr. Barclay was lying in that same position when you left the cabin. Stop talking about it. I said I killed him. What more do you want? I want a lot more. I want to get you out of this jail. And the best way to do it is by putting someone else in here instead. And now, the case of the homely bride. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Agnes Perry is not a pretty girl. And she's so painfully timid that the gossips predicted she'd never get a husband, even with her father's millions. But you never can tell. It's early evening in the Perry home as Tony Barkley, handsome and self-assured, sits facing Agnes's father and her best friend, Linda Forsythe. Mr. Perry, I dropped in to tell you that Agnes won't be home for dinner tonight. You see, we're eloping. Oh, Tony, not really. Oh, I'm so happy for you both. Well, I, uh, an elopement isn't necessary, my boy. If Agnes loves you, Loves I... me? She's mad about me. Oh, Tony, you clown. Oh, give me a handkerchief, somebody. Oh, here you are, Linda. Thanks. And don't say I'm crying, either. It's just that my glasses are getting misty. Agnes and I plan to meet in a little town upstate and be married tonight. In fact, she's waiting there for me now. Well, I, I don't understand. Isn't it a bit unusual to inform the bride's father before an elopement? Yes, but in this case, it makes no difference. You couldn't stop us if you wanted to. But I don't want to, my boy. Of course, I don't know you very well, but uh, just before you came here from the West Coast, we had a letter from my old friend, Judge Hamilton. I know. A letter telling you that I was a fine young man. Plenty of money, good family. How did you know that? I wrote the letter myself. What? And since Judge Hamilton has been abroad, naturally, you haven't been able to check up on me. You wrote that letter? Yes. Forgery is one of my many accomplishments. You should ask the police about me. I'm quite a notorious character, really. You're joking. Not at all. I have a very interesting record. Swindling, fraud, picking pockets, armed robbery. Of course, those were when I was younger and my methods were more crude than they are now. Barclay. Incidentally, my real name is Tony Blaze. What's the point of all this? Well, I was thinking. It's going to be a wonderful story for the newspapers. Millionaire's daughter weds criminal. I'm beginning to understand. You think I'll pay you not to marry my daughter, is that it? Precisely. The only way to stop the wedding now, Mr. Perry, is by writing me a check for $100,000. $100,000? 100, Why, you're out of your mind. Mr. Perry, you know what would happen to a sensitive girl like Agnes if she married this man? You can afford the money. For Agnes' sake, pay him and... I'll give you 10000 and not one cent more. Oh, no. Marrying Agnes will be much more profitable than that. <gasps> Tony, you're not serious. Oh, but I am, my dear. I've just decided in a few months, Mr. Perry will be willing to pay twice 100000 for a nice, quiet divorce, if I make Agnes unhappy enough. And believe me, I can and will. Linda, call the police. Stay where you are, Miss Forsythe. That revolver doesn't frighten me. If either of you charming people tries to stop me, I'll show you I'm not bluffing. If you dare to marry her... Suppose you tell me all about it when I return from my honeymoon, Miss Forsythe. It's been almost an hour since he left, Mr. Carter. I tried everywhere to find you. I'm sorry, Mr. Perry, but Miss Bone and I were both out of the office. You've got to stop them, no matter what it costs. Well, it isn't money that's important now, Mr. Perry. It's time. Well, they can't get married tonight, Nick. Even if they could get a license, there's a three-day waiting period in this state. If he doesn't have a license already, Patsy. Yeah. And if they plan to get married in this state. Oh, if there were only some way to warn every minister and justice of the peace in this part of the country and to tell them... Wait a minute. Huh? There is a way. Well, how, Nick? By radio. Why, yes. The station manager of WQXQ is a friend of mine. 
And if he'll let us run an announcement every now and then... No, no, I... no. We can't put the story on the air, Carter. Think of the scandal. Well, Mr. Perry, the important thing is to keep your daughter from marrying this man, isn't it? Well, I... Yes, of course. All right. Go ahead with the radio announcements, Carter. I, Agnes, take thee, Anthony, to be my lawful wedded husband, to love, honor, and cherish so long as we both may live. Then, by the virtue of the power vested in me, I now pronounce you... Well, this is our cabin, Agnes. Not much of a honeymoon cottage, is it? Oh, I don't mind, darling. <laughs> Nothing matters except that we're married. Oh, Tony, I'm so happy. I... Here, here, stop there. No, no. There, that's the girl. Oh, um, I'd better go put the car out of sight. I don't want anybody to spot it. All right, darling. And while you're gone, I'll unpack your suitcase for Get you. Get away from my suitcase. Well, Tony, I was only going to... Oh, un... I, I, I know, darling, but I'm rather fussy about my things. Uh, look, there's a radio in this cabin. See if you can get some music, huh? I don't want my bride feeling unhappy. Yet. Are believed to be in the vicinity of the state line. We ask all ministers and justices of the peace who may hear this broadcast not to marry any couple answering the description we have just given you and to communicate with the station immediately. The man has boasted that the marriage is merely an attempt to extort money from the girl's father, and that he has a long criminal record. Oh. Your cooperation may oh, prevent a tragedy. It. We now resume our midnight music app. But why did he act that way about the suitcase? As if he had something in it that he didn't want me to see. I've got to know, I've got to. A revolver. Oh, Agnes. Tony. I thought I told you not to open that suitcase. Tony, why are you carrying this? Why, I... I, I always carry a gun, baby. For protection, that's all. Don't lie to me. It was on the radio that you're a criminal, that you only married me because of my father's money. All right, so I did. Why else would anyone marry a stupid little frump like you? Tony. Oh, no, 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 I don't believe it. You said... I said I loved you, huh? And you were sap enough to believe me. But it's cash I'm in love with, darling. Papa's cash. Oh, Tony, you... Oh, I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> Good. Good. I want it that way. And you're going to hate me a lot more unless Papa pays up. I won't stay here a minute longer. I'm going home. Well, no, you're not. Take your hands off me. Tony, look. Why, you little... Slap me, will you? No dame can get away with that. Keep away from me, Tony. I can play rough, too. Don't you touch me. I'll... I'll kill you if you do. <laughs> Don't kid me. You haven't got nerve enough to use that gun. I will. I swear I will. I'm going to give you a little lesson in wifely. You... You! You little fool, you! Tony! Mr. Perry, well, where have you been? Do you realize it's 8 o'clock in the morning? I've been walking the streets for hours. When we didn't hear anything by midnight, I knew it wasn't any use. Well, it's a good thing somebody stayed here at the radio station. Nick's on the phone now. You mean they've been found? I think so. Listen. I see. Well, thank you, Mr. Megley. Yes, I'm sorry, too, but it was good of you to call. Goodbye. Who was it, Carter? A justice of the peace from upstate. What? He heard the announcement on the morning newscast. A justice of the peace? You mean they're married? Yes. Oh. He said he performed the ceremony at 10.30 last night. I... I see. Well, I suppose there's nothing to do now but go home and wait. Oh, I'll get it, Patsy. Uh-huh. You better go tell the announcer not to broadcast any more of those notices. All right, Nick. Nick Carter speaking. This is Linda Forsythe, Mr. Carter. Is Agnes' father there? Oh, yes, just a moment. For you, Mr. Perry, Miss Forsythe. Oh, I asked Linda to stay at my house last night. I wonder if Agnes has called her... Uh, hello, Linda. Mr. Perry, I have wonderful news. Agnes is back. She's there at the house now? Yes, yeah, she must have come home during the night sometime. Is that man with her? No. Uh, one of the maids found Agnes asleep in her own room a few minutes ago. But but she's locked herself in and won't talk to me. I uh, think Never mind. We'll be home in ten minutes. <laughs> Leave me 
alone. Leave me alone. I won't tell you anything about it. But, Miss Perry, we know you and Tony Blaze were married <laughs> last night. And naturally, your father wants to know why you came home alone. Nick, why don't you give her a chance to get control of herself before you start firing questions at her? Maybe you're right, Patsy. Perhaps you'd feel better if you had some breakfast, Agnes. I don't want anything. I beg pardon, Mr. Perry. Yes, Gordon? There's a gentleman who insists upon seeing Miss Agnes. My daughter isn't seeing anyone. Tell him to go away. It wouldn't do any good if he did tell me, Mr. Well, Perry. Sergeant Matheson. Hello, Patsy. Hi, Nick. Hi, Matty. What are you doing here? Official business, Nick. What do you mean, official business? I didn't send for the police. The police? No, no, no. I didn't do anything. Of course not, dear. He isn't here to see you. Uh, that's where you're wrong, Mr. Perry. I'm here to arrest your daughter on suspicion of murder. Agnes Perry's despair is equaled by the shock and grief in the eyes of her father as Matty makes the arrest. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to The Case of the Homely Bride. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's a couple of hours later, and at police headquarters, Agnes Perry is giving her version of what happened in the tourist cabin the night before. When Tony admitted that, that he only married me in order to get money out of father, I said I was going home. He grabbed me and... And I... you had a fight. That's when you fell against the chair near the bed and broke your watch, wasn't it, Miss No, Perry? no, there wasn't any fight. I noticed the crystal is missing from your watch. And we found thin pieces of curved glass near that upset chair. I don't know anything about that. I okay, don't... okay, go ahead. What time was all this? Well, about 12.30, I think. Yeah? Then what happened? Well, I broke away from him, ran outside to my car, and drove home. And during the time it took you to get in the car, start the motor, and put it in gear, why didn't he catch up with you? Well, he, he, he didn't try. He only chased me as far as the door. He chased you to the door, yet you still found time to stop and pick up your coat? No, I didn't. I just ran. I didn't stop for anything. Okay, okay. Now I'll tell you what really happened. You fought with Tony Blaze about 3 o'clock. No! Not 12.30, because the medical examiner says he was shot sometime between 3 and 4 a.m. It was 12.30, I tell you. Huh? I mean, that's when I left the cabin. Oh, and when you broke away, you didn't run out the door. You picked up that gun of his and shot him. No, no, I didn't. After that, you didn't need to hurry, so you got your coat and purse, walked out to the car and came it's home. It's a lie. I didn't shoot him. All right, then why are your fingerprints all over the gun and only your fingerprints? I told you, I found it in his suitcase. I picked it up. Yeah. Excuse me, excuse me, Matty. Yeah, Nick? I suppose you've had ballistics check the revolver to be sure it's the one that killed Tony Blaze. Well, naturally. All three bullets came out of the same gun. We dug two out of the wall, the one that missed him completely and the one that grazed his head. There was a third bullet in his heart. And I see... Well, why are you so sure it happened at exactly 3.15? Because, Nick, something aroused the woman who runs the camp. She realized later it must have been the shooting, of course. She looked out her window and saw Miss Perry here leaving. Wearing a coat? Yeah, a white coat you could see a mile off. That's how the woman knew who it was. Miss Perry was wearing that same coat when she checked into the place. She's lying. I left my coat at the cabin when I ran out. It's not there now, Miss Perry. But I did... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's forget the coat a minute, Matty. Huh? About the time element. Couldn't the woman be mistaken? No, not a chance, Nick. In the first place, she looked at her clock. In the second place, she wasn't even home until after 2.30. Oh. You see, Nick, none of the other cabins were rented last night, so the woman went into town to a party. I see. Now, look, Miss Perry. Everybody knows Tony Blaze was a king-size heel. So maybe if you would admit the truth... I won't admit anything. Would... You're trying to trap me. Okay, okay, then. I'll have to hold you for the grand jury. And I hope you've got a better story then than you have now. I can't believe it. Agnes accused of murder, policeman here in my home, searching for evidence. Please don't worry, Mr. Perry. No jury will ever convict Agnes under the circumstances. Maybe they won't, Miss Forsythe, if she'd admit the circumstances. And if she sticks to the story she told at headquarters, she may be charged with first-degree murder. Well, you're probably right, Carter. Even I can see that Agnes is lying. But why but... should she lie about such unimportant things? The time and whether or not she was wearing a coat... Well, she's hysterical, that's all. You don't know Agnes as I do, Mr. Carter. She's always been terribly shy and frightened of everybody. How long have you known her, Miss Forsythe? Well, 
Only about six months, really. But, but we've been like sisters. Oh, Nick. What's the matter, Patsy? I asked Gordon, uh, the butler, you know. Oh, yes, yes, I know. Well, I asked him to come down here and tell you what he just told Sergeant Matheson. Tell him, Gordon. Well, sir, it's just that I heard Miss Agnes come home last night. Then why didn't you tell somebody, Gordon? You knew how frantic we all well, were. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Perry, but I didn't know it was Miss Agnes at the time. I, I thought it was you, sir. Why should you think that? Couldn't it have been Miss Forsythe here or one of the servants? Oh, no, sir. The only persons with a latch key are Miss Agnes, Mr. Perry, and myself, sir. Anyone else would have to ring the doorbell to get in. What time was this? About 4.30, Mr. Carter. I see. How did you happen to be awake at that time, Gordon? Well, after I locked the house at 1 o'clock, sir, I didn't sleep well for worrying about Miss Agnes. That's how I happened to be awake at 4.30 and heard the front door open and close. Then, uh, a moment later, I heard her open the door to the basement. The basement? Why should Agnes have gone down there? Well, that's what Sergeant Matheson wanted to know. So he went down to have a look. Agnes was telling the truth about leaving the tourist camp at 12.30 or 1. She'd have been home long before that. But if she left at 3.15, the time would be just about right. That's what I was thinking. Mm. Well, Nick, Nick, I found it. What, Matty? The white coat Miss Perry said she didn't wear home. She tried to burn it in the furnace, but there's still plenty left for identification. And look at those blood stains. Is that Agnes's coat, Mr. Perry? Yes, I... I'm afraid it is. And it's the last piece of evidence needed to smash that story of hers to smithereens. Oh, what's the use? Yes, 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 I shot him. Now I hope you're satisfied. Please, Miss Perry, don't look on us as enemies. <laughs> Patsy and I came here to the jail hoping we could help you. That's the truth, Miss Perry. Why don't you tell Nick just what happened? <laughs> Well, he was going to hit me. I warned him to stay away, but he kept coming with that awful look on his face. I was almost out of my mind with fear. I, I didn't even realize what I was doing. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> look, you mustn't get excited. You see, Nick, it was self-defense. Yeah, but the next thing is to prove it. Oh, how can you with everybody lying about me? Nobody's lying about you, Miss They're Perry. all lying. That woman at the camp, the police, even Gordon. They lied about the code, about the time it happened, even about my breaking my watch. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you still insist that the shooting took place at 12.30 and that you came back home without your coat? Of course I do, because it's the truth. And you didn't fall against that chair and break your watch, Crystal? I didn't fall against anything. Hmm. hmm. Look, Miss Perry, how many times did you fire that revolver? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, wait. I have a picture here that the police photographer took of the body. I don't want to see it. You've got to. This is important. All right. Now tell me. Was this the way he was lying when you left the cabin? No. No, he was more on his side and not next to the bed. He, he was over by the easy chair. He must have lived long enough to crawl a few feet. No, Patsy, uh, that last bullet killed him instantly. Well, please stop talking about it. I said I killed him. What more do you want? I want a lot more, Miss Perry. I want to get you out of this cell. <laughs> and the best way to do it is by putting someone else here instead. Sergeant Matheson, this is Patsy. Nick just got back to the office, and he wants to know whether you have any report on those fingerprints yet. Uh, and the broken glass, too, Patsy. Oh, yes, the glass fragments, too, Sergeant. Okay, I'll hold on. He's gone for the report now, Nick. Good. Why this sudden interest in fingerprints? You know the only prints on the revolver that killed Tony Blaze was Agnes's. I know, but these are different. I got one of them from a teacup, and the other off the lock button on the Perry's front door. Off the what? A little button on the lock that you press when you want to leave the door off the latch. But what the... Oh, yes, Sergeant. They were. And how about the glass? I see. Yes, yes, I'll tell him. Goodbye. What did he say? Those fingerprints were both made by the same person. But it wasn't Agnes Perry. That's what I hoped for. And how about the pieces of glass? Well, it seems that Agnes is telling the truth about her watch, at least. Those fragments weren't from a watch crystal after all. They were optical glass. That makes things more interesting. Better get your hat, Patsy. We're going to travel. Oh, it's awfully nice of you to drive us up here, Miss Forsythe. Well, naturally, if talking to this woman at the tourist camp will help poor Agnes's defense, I'm only too glad. Uh, is it straight ahead on this road? No, you turn left at the next corner and follow the river road. Turn left? Yeah, haven't you ever been up this way before? No. 
I had no idea it was so mountainous. Do you really think you can do anything to help Agnes, Mr. Carter? I do. As a matter of fact, I intend to prove that Agnes Perry didn't kill her husband. But but she confessed. I know she did, but I found a fingerprint on the latch button of the front door that's going to convict the real murderer. I don't understand. Uh, here's the turn, Miss Forsyth. Oh. I, I almost missed that. Yeah. And you turned right, Miss Forsyth. I told you to make a left turn. Oh, oh, how stupid of me. I'll turn around. No, no, never mind. The tourist camp is on this road. But how did you know? What? Well, I, I didn't. <laughs> oh, what's the road to go over the cliff? It's all right. I, I just swerved to avoid that dog. I didn't see it until it was almost under our wheels. Oh, you, you almost gave me heart failure. It must be a hundred feet down to the river. Miss Forsythe probably didn't notice the dog because she doesn't see so well without her glasses, Patsy. My glasses? How did you know that I... You usually wear them while driving, don't you? Well, of course I do, but... But they're broken, aren't they, Miss Forsythe? You broke them last night in the tourist cabin where you killed Tony Blaze. That's utterly ridiculous. You say you've never been over this road before? I haven't. Yet because you were excited, you took the right-hand turn, even though I purposely told you to turn left. That doesn't mean anything. I'd say it means you made this same trip before. Last night, when you slipped the latch on the front door of the Perry home so that you could get back in unobserved. I did no such thing. Oh, yes, you did. Your fingerprint was on the push button of the automatic lock. The same print you left on a teacup this afternoon. Suppose I did touch that push button. You still can't prove I was ever in that cabin. I think we can. By having an Oculus compare the pieces of broken glass found in the cabin with a prescription for your eyeglasses. All right, smart boy. So I did kill him. But I won't go to the chair for it. I'd rather die this way. Nick, we're going over the cliff! <laughs> Linda Forsythe twists the wheel of the speeding car toward the edge of the cliff with its hundred-foot drop, intending to kill not only herself, but Nick and Patsy as well. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Homely Bride, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Rather than take a chance on the electric chair, Linda Forsythe turns the wheel of her fast-moving car toward the side of the mountain road, where there is a sheer hundred-foot drop. Nick, we're going over the cliff! Let go the wheel, you... Patsy, don't try to jump! Oh. oh, oh, thank heaven. We hit a tree instead of going over. Yeah. I managed to twist the wheel enough to avoid that. Yeah, but, but even hitting a tree at that speed, I mean, why aren't we smashed up more? I managed to get my foot on the brake and jammed it down hard. Why did you have to go snooping around? They'd have acquitted Agnes, but... But it made me a different story for you. Why did you kill Tony Blaze anyway? He double-crossed me. I was the one he was going to marry, not Agnes. He said it would only be a bluff to get money out of her father. Then you were in on the whole scheme. Well, of course I was. Tony would never have been able to meet Agnes if I hadn't made friends with her and introduced him. And then you stayed right with her so that you could encourage the courtship, huh? I did it. Because I loved him. And he said he loved me. We were going to take the money and get married. And then he... And then he decided it'd be more profitable in the long run to marry Agnes and collect afterwards. Yes. I knew where they'd gone, so I came up here to have it out with him. And then he got nasty. He hit me. So it was you who fell over the chair and broke your glasses. Yes. I must have gone crazy. I grabbed up the gun But and... Agnes said she shot him. She did. What? One bullet went wild and another grazed his head and made him unconscious. He, he'd just come out of it a little while before I got there. And you got the idea of putting the blame on her, huh? Yes. I was sure her fingerprints were still on the gun. Tony was still groggy. He didn't notice what I was doing. So I picked it up with my handkerchief. And finished the job. And then you put on Agnes's white coat before leaving the cabin so that if anyone saw you, they'd think it was she. That's right. Oh, Mr. Carter, what do you think they'll do to me? I don't know, Miss Forsythe. But since you're so fond of wearing Agnes Perry's clothes, we'll see how that prison uniform of hers will fit you. Well, Nick, what about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser will bring us next week? It's a story, Mike, about a politician who found an oriental dancer in his bathtub, dead. And Nick didn't like the costume the corpse was wearing because it exposed an uneven suntan. But what's suntan got to do with murder? It had plenty to do with this one, Mike. 
along with a jealous wife and a sideshow barker and an old-fashioned political rally. Well, now, that sounds like quite an adventure. What do you call it, Nick? I call it The Case of the Candidate's Corpse. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.